You already getting the word of God this morning? Amen. Well, if you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's word, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. And as we go through the theme of 2020, we're talking about uh, the word distinct, something different, something noticeable, something uh, that's set out, set apart. And one thing that we're going to see in this message is that Daniel had a distinct prayer life. And so we're going to look at the prayer life of Daniel. And the question we got to ask ourselves is, do I have a distinct prayer life? How is my prayer before God? So Daniel chapter 10, starting with verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he, he understood the word, and had understanding of the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, I pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and our minds. God, as we examine Daniel's life and his life of prayer, I pray, God, that you would... Uh, Speak to our hearts, Lord. Help us, God, to have a distinct prayer life, one that is consistent, one that is filled with compassion and passion as we seek your face. Lord, help me to preach plain and clear this morning. Out of all the people in the room, there is a strict judgment on my life in rightly dividing your word of truth, and I accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, in his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We read Daniel 10, verses 1 through 3, and this is where we get the 21 days. And so as a church, there's several of us that's going through uh, a Daniel fast. And it's 21 days of abstaining from meat and uh, eating mainly vegetables and fruit and that types of food. And, um, and you know, a question, a question comes, uh, everybody wonders, is this really a fast? We know that fast in the Bible is going to be one day, three days, seven days, even 40 days. And most of the time a fast is without food or, or and even food and water uh, if it's a short fast. Uh, there was only one required fast in the, for the Hebrew people, and that was on the Day of Atonement. Uh, but, but when we look at what Daniel's doing here, uh, the ESV Study Bible, the Reformation Study Bible, the CSB Study Bible, Matthew Henry and, and John Calvin, just to name a few, all see what Daniel is doing here in chapter 10 as a fast, or at least as a partial fast. And so this year, as we started 2020, we challenged the church, and some of you have taken that challenge, to take 21 days and set aside for some prayer and fasting. And I will say this, that if you have taken that challenge or you ever do fast, if you focus more on the food rather than on the prayer, then all you did was a diet. Okay? Because it's not, it is more about the prayer than anything else. So a time of fasting, so in Daniel 10 here, Daniel gets this revelation and he sees this vision and he is encountered uh, by an angel and he is moved and disturbed and he goes on this 21 day t intense prayer of seeking the Lord. We also see the prayer life in Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 through 5 in the first year of Darius the son of uh, Azar Azarus the, the, the by descent, I'm having trouble this morning, I, just bear with me. By descent, a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Daniel receives a revelation is what is to come upon his people. And what he realizes is that the sin of his people has placed them where they are. God had t 
told them that if you will obey my voice, if you will follow my laws, then blessing will follow you. But if you ever turn from me and walk according to your own ways and do not obey me, then I will bring cursing. The Israelites had not obeyed God. They were disobedient. They were stiff-necked. They were rebellious. And God was patient with them, but he finally brought judgment upon them and allowing King Nebuchadnezzar to come and destroy their temple and to take them captive. And now they were an oppressed people and God's judgment was on them. Now notice what Daniel does here in this time of seeking the Lord. Verse 3, Then I turned my face to the Lord, God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. Now, when you seek the Lord in prayer and fasting, there's many reasons to do that. Some are this. To seek the Lord for wisdom, for discernment, for an answer to prayer, for mercy, for forgiveness and restoration. And so what Daniel does is he realizes that their people has been disobedient to God. They were under the judgment of God. And so he cries out, and on behalf of the people, he repents of the sin. And he humbles himself before God and says, God, great and mighty, we have sinned against you. And it's a prayer of repentance. And if we want to seek the Lord and we want God to move in our lives, we must humble ourselves before God and allow him to examine our hearts and examine our minds. And be bold enough to pray the prayer that David prayed. Lord, search me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, O God. We all talk about revival and we want revival. And and I've heard revivalists in the past. And I've even heard uh, my pastor before he has said, you know, if if you really want a revival to happen, here's what you need to do. First, you need to go and get one of those pieces of sidewalk chalk. Parents of kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? Sidewalk chalk. You're thinking, how's this deal going to do with revival? Go out in your driveway, draw you a big circle, and then stand right in the middle of it and say, Lord, let it begin right here. Let it begin in my heart Because here's the problem. We go to prayer and fasting. Many of us, we pray about other people. Lord, fix them. Because everybody else is the problem and it can never be us. Huh? Come on now. I'm going to preach today. Whether you want to listen or not, it's going to happen. Okay? I'm going to let it fly. Whether it sticks, that's up to you. Many of us, you know, if my boss could think the way I think, he'd be a smart guy. If everybody else that I worked around, if they, could, if they weren't so unpleasant, maybe, maybe it would be a good place to work in. If it wasn't for her or him, if my husband, if I could get him to do this, or if my wife, if I could get her to do this. And it's always, it's always about trying to fix other people, but where we need to start is with our own heart. Amen. Amen? We need to start right here. Lord, is there any problem in my attitude? Is there any problem in my pride? Is there any problem in my ego? Is there any problem in my selfishness? Is there any problem in my greed? Is there lust in my heart? Is there bitterness in my heart? Is there anger in my heart? Lord, reveal to me. Lord, I, and, and, and realize I am a sinner and I need you, Lord. God, forgive me and humble yourself before God in humility. And say, Lord, I I have sinned against you and and I need you, God. I need your mercy. I need your grace to cover over me. Lord, make me into the man, to the woman that you have created me to be. Amen. Let it start there. And so Daniel, Daniel, in, in these two instances of his life, one, he receives a revelation 
and, uh, and, uh, and is encountered by an angel, and he seeks the Lord in discernment for 21 days. And a, a, another instance, he, he sees a vision, a prophecy. He reveals, is being revealed a prophecy of what's going to come upon his people. So he seeks the Lord uh, in prayer and fasting. But if I were to tell you, we're going to talk about Daniel and his prayer life, and I was going to talk about Daniel, and you were to guess what we might talk about about Daniel... What would be the thing that you would think of first? So, word association here. When I say Daniel, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Daniel lion. and the lion's den, right? Daniel and the lion's den. Well, that is a good place to go, and we're going to go there right now because Daniel and the lion's den is another example of his prayer life. Here we go. Look at Daniel chapter 6, starting at verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished. I like that word, distinguished. Kind of sounds like a word, distinct, right? He was different. There's something different about Daniel. There's a distinction over his life. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps. That's other officials. That's governing officials. Why? Because what? An excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Let's just pause right there for a moment. Daniel's life is distinct. Why? Because he is faithful to his God. He has the reputation of being a God-fearer and a God-follower. You're going to see Dan when you see Daniel, you're going to see a man of God. And God's hand was upon him. Now he was a foreigner. Right? He was a Hebrew. He's now in a Babylonian, Medo-Persian empire. This is, a, this is a Gentile king. But yet he's finding favor among these kings. And he's putting, been put in place of high position. Well, the other, the Medo-Persian natives who are also officials, they don't like that this foreigner, this Hebrew guy, is going to have this high of a position. And so they're mad. They want him to be dismissed. They want him out. And so they're going to come up with a plan. They want him gone. And here's what they think. Then these men said, notice their discussion here. with, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Now, I want to pause just right there for a moment and talk about the beauty of Daniel's distinct life. Now, think about it. Here are these non-believers, these people who don't believe in the Hebrew God. They, They don't believe in Yahweh. They believe in pagan gods. But they notice one thing about Daniel's life. One thing about Daniel's life is that he is a faithful follower of his God. And they know that he is a man that will not break laws, will not do anything wrong, unless it pertains to his God. You won't find Daniel doing anything that he shouldn't be doing unless we can come up with a plan. And so they they get together and they come up with this plan. You could just imagine them, right? They're all huddled together and say, what are we going to do about Daniel? He's a problem. Can you believe he's going to be high official? I mean... He's not, he's not even one of us. He's a Hebrew. Who does he think he is? I tell you, well, here's what we're going to do. i got a plan. Okay, what is it? We're going to convince the king to create a law where he's not allowed to pray. And then when he prays, because we know he will because he's a God-fearing man, and when he prays, we're going to catch him. And we're going to tell him to the king, oh, and they, they all think, oh, that, that's awesome, man. They're giving fist bumps to each other. They're like, yeah, that is a great, excellent plan. And so they go to the king Darius, and they go, hey, king, we, 
we are so overwhelmed by your glory. You are a magnificent king, King Darius. You are wise above all. You are the king of all kings. Darius' ego is getting puffed up. We think it would be good if you would create a law where no one could pray to any god but you, for you are awesome. And the king is hearing all this. Oh, yeah, same one. And he gets puffed up with pride. And he thinks, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Everybody, nobody can pray to any god but me. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I think that's a good idea. Great. They're like, well, sign it into law. Put it into law. Write it down so it cannot be undone. So he signs it into law, puts his seal on it. It is a law. It's a decree. It cannot be overturned. No one can pray to any god. If you're going to pray, you have to pray to King Darius. And it goes out. And those guys who are jealous of Daniel think, we've got him. So what happens? Let's look. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And that's the point that I want to make. As he had done what? Previously. What does that mean? That means that Daniel had a distinct prayer life to where he had a habit of going into his upper chambers, having the windows open, lifting his hands toward heaven, and praying to his God. He did that three times a day. He did it every single day, over and over and over again. How do you think those guys come up with the, with the uh, plan to make a law against prayer? Because they saw him, they watched him, they knew Daniel was a prayer warrior, they knew Daniel had a life of prayer. Let me ask you a question. Does people recognize you as a man or woman of prayer? Do they know that you pray? Would that be something distinct in your life? They knew Daniel prayed, so they come up with this, this way to try to get him arrested. And so Daniel, he didn't change anything about his life. He said, there's a law that says we can't pray. It doesn't matter. I'm going to keep on doing what I've been doing every single day. I'm not going to allow a law of the land to change my mind. I'm going to go back up. I'm not going to close my doors, uh, my, the windows. I'm going to keep doing what I've always been doing, and I'm going to pray. Now, here's the thing. Here's what Daniel didn't do. Y'all ready? You got your still toes on. It's going to get a little stomping here just a little bit. You ready? Because here's what he didn't do. Daniel was not a man who did not pray. And then a law comes out. You cannot pray to any god but the king Darius. And then Daniel awake and go, huh, well, I tell you what, they ain't going to tell me I can't pray. I'm going to get up there and I'm going to open up my windows and I'm going to pray anyway. <laughs> he did what he has always been doing. Here's the problem that I see in American Christianity. You ready for it? Here we go. We don't pray. Oh, goodness, they're going, they took prayer out of school. They took prayer out of the public school. We got to vote for somebody going to put prayer back in there. Let me tell you something. If you're a child of God, prayer should never leave the school. Amen. I, ain't getting, they, I can't take my Bible to work. I can't take my Bible to school. You never brought it to work anyway. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, it'll change, won't it? The boss say, yeah, you can't bring your Bible to, church, to, to, to work this week. Huh, by God, I tell you what, you ain't going to tell me I can't bring my Bible. Where's my Bible? <laughs> That's how we would, would be. I'm preaching truth right now. I tell you what, one day in this nation, they might make it illegal for us to share our faith. You ain't sharing your faith anyway. You've got to do it now. Don't wait until there's a law that says you can't do it. You've got to go ahead and do it. Be a man of prayer. Be a woman of prayer. Be a person that shares your faith. Be a person that is a witness for the glory of God. Do it now. We should live our lives in such a way that it doesn't matter what laws get passed. I'm going to do it anyway because this is what I always do because this is who I am. I'm a child of the Most High God and I will serve Him, follow Him. I've got a different spirit within me. I have a different attitude. I have a different mindset. I am distinct. I am set apart. I am called by God for a special purpose and I'm going to walk and live that out. That's got to be our attitude amen and so Daniel spring and guess what those guys come find him they barge in his room oh, Daniel what are you doing are you praying to your God don't you know that's a law and they run to the king and they tell the king hey King Darius Daniel the one you've put in charge over everything he was praying to his God. Didn't you make a decree that said anybody who prayed to any God but you would be thrown in the lion's den? King Darius realized he'd been tricked. They appealed to his ego and pride, and he put a law in. And he was in anguish. He didn't know what to do. He's trying to think of a way to get Daniel out because he liked Daniel. But he had a, made a law. He could not undo that law. And so he goes to Daniel and he, he tells Daniel, is it true that you were praying to your God? Yeah. He, he says, may the Lord, your God, you serve, watch over you, protect you, keep watch over you. They throw him in the lion's den and, and the king's anxious all night. First thing in the morning, he, he wakes up and, and he asks, Hey, Daniel, Daniel, did the God you serve, the one that you pray to, the one that you serve faithfully, continually, all the days, did he protect you and watch over you? He says, King, I'm okay. For God sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lions. And I'm fine. Now, when Daniel got thrown in the, that lion's den, because he had a distinct prayer life, I imagine this one way. I can, can imagine it two ways, but I imagine it one way. When he got thrown in that lion's den, do you th how do you think Daniel, what do you think one of the first things Daniel did? I believe he prayed. Now, we're not told that he did, but I, I'm going I'm to believe that. And my question is this, what kind of prayer... Do you think Daniel prayed when he got thrown in that lion's den? Do you think it was an American prayer? Oh, Lord! Why? Why me? Oh, God! Help me, 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 help me. Do you think it was that kind of prayer? I don't. I think he was thrown that lion's den. I think he bowed his knee. He lifted up his hands to heaven. And he said, Sovereign God, Lord over all, I fully trust in you. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lion so his servant would be spared. Now, where did Daniel, I think, have this confidence, and how did he know that God would protect him? 
Remember when we started, we read in Daniel chapter 10? In Daniel chapter 10, we're not told, uh, we, don't, we don't exactly know when this, this, this vision happened. Scholars vary. They, they all say that it happened around the time of the Daniel and the lion's den event. So it could have happened before or it could have happened after. And because we don't know, I'm going to believe, you don't have to, but I'm going to believe that Daniel 10 happened before he was thrown in the lion's den. Because as Daniel was, was seeking God's discernment, in Daniel chapter 10, he is visited by an angelic being whose eyes were a flaming fire and his legs was burnished bronze. And when he spoke, he spoke with multitudes of thousands. And he was, he, he was at the point of death. Daniel fainted. He was fearful. He didn't know what was going on. He was afraid. And the Bible tells us in Daniel 10, 12, Then he said to me, and this is the angel, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. That's his prayers. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come." In verse 20, he, then he says, Do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Can I tell you what's happening right there? What's going on as Daniel's praying and he's seeing a vision of this angel? That angel is declaring to him and saying, Daniel, when you were praying and fasting and seeking the Lord for 21 days, what you were doing in the natural had effects in the supernatural. There was a war, an angelic battle was going on. The spiritual darkness of wickedness was raging against the, the, uh, the angels of the Almighty. And, and the prince of Persia, the demonic spirit, was holding me up for these 21 days. Then Michael, the archangel, came to my side and, and he fought with me. And now I've come to you to tell you that I'm going to be with you and that you're going to be delivered. And here's what's going to happen. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the who? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then he jumps down there in verse 18, praying all the times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end to keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Can I tell you this, Christian? When you go to your knees in prayer, there is a spiritual battle raging around you. Everything that's going on in the natural, there is supernatural happening above us. There is the kingdom of darkness that's trying to overtake cities, nations, states, your homes. And there is a darkness that's all around us. And the prayer is where the war is won. Prayer is not an afterthought. Prayer is not, what do I do now? Oh, I guess I ought to pray about it. No, prayer is the first thing you ought to do. It is the way that you get the armies of heaven unleashed around you where they are on battle for you and for the purpose of God in your life. You say, what's going on with society? What's going on with our culture? What's happening? What is it? It's the spiritual darkness all around us. And the saints of God, we need to be people of God on our knees, in prayer, raging war, doing battle. There's a battle raging right now over the souls of some men and women in this place right now. Right now, there is a spiritual war that is being raged over some of the hearts of some men and women right here in this room. Why? Because they're not saved. 
Some of you, you've never, you've never confessed your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never called upon the name of the Lord for salvation. And so Satan doesn't want you to come to the light. No, he's holding you captive. And all it takes is a prayer. It takes a prayer, a call upon the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner. I need to trust in you. Would you save me? One call from a repentant heart breaks the chains of the oppressor and brings you into the kingdom of God. We know that the angels in heaven are celebrating over one sinner that repents. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said? The angels rejoice. Now think about this. I hadn't looked at this until I was preparing this message. Well, I wonder why there's so much celebration over the angels. Because if you are an unbeliever, there is a demonic force that wants to keep you in the dark. And there are people praying for you. There's moms, there's dads, there's cousins, there's uncles, there's nieces, there's nephews, there's, a, there's churches praying for you. They're praying for the battle that's raging over your soul. And when that sinner finally calls upon the name of the Lord and trusts in Jesus, the shackles of hell are broken and the door of heaven is open and the angels begin to celebrate and shout for they've gained victory for the kingdom of God. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with every heart out there that is disconnected from God, I want you to know one thing. There is a God in heaven who loves you. He came and he died for you. He rose again on the third day so that you might be forgiven and set free and promised eternity in heaven. And if you will call upon his name this morning, you will be saved. And those of us who are children of God, let us not grow weary let us not see prayer as something that we just throw in here and there and we sprinkle it in our life, but let it be the foundation of our life. Let God work among us. Let's pray. Father.